right, welcome. Whoa, hello, hello. Uh, welcome to the uh, workshop, or I don't know, uh, open source workshop. Um, this was supposed to be a lot of people talking um, and back and forth, but I, only, I was the only one who signed up. So it's gonna be me presenting. Um, but it was supposed to be informal and I would really like to keep it informal. So I'm gonna do a presentation of my work and if you have any questions, just ask. Don't even raise your hand, okay? Let's keep it as informal as possible. Um, all right, so my name is Fernando Leiva Bertran. I'm from a professor at ASU and I work on innovation theory and um, this is a side project that turned into a huge research project of something that I love, um, which is essentially fairness in ranking. So how can we be fair and efficient in ranking when you have tournaments that are incomplete? And so let me tell you two stories that I love because I'm a sports fan. Um, the two Cinderella stories of the last decade, I think, are Leicester City in the English Premier League. The Premier League is a uh, tournament with 20 teams where every team plays each other twice. So it's a twice complete tournament. The odds of Leicester City uh, being champions were 5,000 to one. It ended with a final record of 23 wins, 12 ties and three losses. The second best team ended with a record of 20 wins, 11 ties and seven losses. There was no doubt Leicester City was the champion that year. And then on the other hand, we have um, <clears throat> University of Central Florida, which was uh, preseason odds of 1,000 to one to win the tournament. In a tournament that has 130 teams, where each team plays about 11, well, maybe 12, maybe 13, maybe 14. They don't even play that same number of games. Um, 10%, you play against 10% of the field. UCF ended with 13 wins and zero losses. The next best team, 13 wins and one loss. And somehow, UCF ended up in sixth place. So how can that be? What was the system that was used to rank teams that led to UCF ending up in sixth place? Well, we all know that the college football um, has a committee and the committee decides where to rank the different teams. And of course, um, it begs the question, is that the way we should be doing it? Or is there a uh, better way of doing it? A way that is fair and reasonable and objective. And so that's what I set out to do. And the way in which I approach the problem is, all right, let's think about a set of axioms that we want our ranking system or our scoring system to satisfy. And if we believe in these axioms, then those axioms themselves will lead us to the scoring system that we wanna use. So the benchmark that uh, I decided to use was win percentages. And win percentage is really the win-loss record. And why? It's because every league that, where there's wins and losses, what you typically do is you count the wins, divide by the number of games, that gives you your win percentage, or if you want the win-loss record. If the tournament is complete, everybody played against everybody, so there's no issue about strength of schedule or anything like that. And win percentages make perfect sense, and that's why they're used everywhere. So, <clears throat> let me just keep going. You know, you can formally calculate what a win percentage is. I want to speed up the talk so that we get to the interesting stuff. Uh, but of, of this, I want you to keep this W, which is the win matrix, because it's gonna show up in the other slides. The win matrix has all the wins um, and losses of a given tournament. And an entry IJ is one or two if team I beat team J once or twice, um, and zero if that didn't happen. So think of the win matrix also as the tournament results or a scoring problem. Knowing the results, what should your final ranking be based off of scores that you give each team, the scores are gonna be these Bs. So you're gonna give every team a final score and that's gonna determine the final ranking. So it's pretty simple. 
All right, now, the types of scoring methods that I decided to study are uh, scoring methods where you add up points. So it's really, really simple. You, you want to add up the points for a team I by assigning a certain amount of points to team I for having beaten team J if they played each other. If they played more than once, then this will capture how many times team I beat team J. If team J beats team I, then team I gets a different amount of points. This could be zero. This could be negative, but it's something different for having lost to team J. And you do this for every, for every single team. And then once you've added up all the points, you divide by the number of games that they play. Why do I have to divide by the number of games? Because not all teams play the same number of games. And that gives you your final score. So it's a pretty simple mechanism, but of course, the meat is in how many points do you assign each team for beating every other team, okay? All right, and so I'm gonna develop axioms that put restrictions on these guys, okay? And I'm gonna show you six axioms, and hopefully they look trivial. It, the, the more trivial they sound to you, the better, okay? It means that I'm not imposing too many restrictions on the system. All right, so once I do that, I'm gonna show you a family of scoring methods that um, uniquely satisfies these axioms. I'm also gonna develop a standard of efficiency, and I'll talk more about that when we get there. And then finally, because it's a family of scoring methods, there's gonna be one free parameter, and I can calibrate that free parameter to match as closely as possible the rankings of the NCAA, which now gives me the power to, ob to have an objective ranking that is very close match to the subjective ranking of the NCAA, and I can compute things like biases in the rankings by conference, by team, um, and I can go back to answering the question of whether for example, UCF should have been declared the, the champion or not. Okay, so all of that is coming. So I can evaluate the extent to which the rankings are fair, efficient, and search for biases. Okay, and that's what I do. All right, let's go through the axioms. Axiom one is super simple. It says if I relabel two teams on any tournament, then the scores for those two teams should just flip, right? And I have a little diagram here. Notice that in tournament one, you have six teams. Team one beats teams three and five. Team two beats four and five, but loses to six. So hopefully you get uh, the idea. But in tournament W prime, all I did was I called team one, team two, and team two, team one. And so what this should do is it should result in something like this. The points I assign team one for beating team three, so here's team one, beat team three, should be under W, under this tournament, should be exactly the same as the points that I assigned the now relabeled team two for beating team three on this new tournament. So that's called anonymity. Okay, we want our ranking system to not depend on the name of a team. Okay. And again, stop me, shout, raise your hands, or I'll just keep going. All right, axiom two, win and loss fairness. Again, a very simple axiom. It says, if I beat another team and you beat the same other team, we should both get the same number of points for beating that other team, okay? So here's another example. Notice that here, um, <coughs> team one beat team five and team two also beat team five. And so what this says, is that ultimately the points that I give team one for beating team five, this is that F squiggle one five, should be the same as the points that I give team two for beating team five. Um, so I'll just keep going if there's, Question. yes, there you go, <coughs> finally. Explain how that axiom is different than axiom one, it seems like we chose axiom one of the good one would be implied, is that, is that not true? No, um, because in axiom, so sometimes the axiom, whoa, this is not going back. Oh, there we go. 
Sometimes the actions will lead to the same results in certain specific instances, but not in general. And so here, what I did was I just relabeled teams one and team two. And what this says is that under W, the points that one gets for beating three should be the same as under a different tournament, W prime, the points that team two gets for beating team three. So W and W prime are different tournaments, okay? Whereas here, we're talking about the same tournament W. Within the same tournament W, the points that one gets for beating five should be the same as the points that two gets for beating five because they both beat the same team. Awesome, yeah. Go ahead, I have like 10 people, all right, go. Because okay, I, I, I see where you're going. How do you factor in, in general, more information that you could use? If what I want to do is use this to predict um, outcomes, future outcomes, like if I want to use this to, to place bets, this is not what you want. This is a performance-based system to rank teams. Okay, um, this will never be useful for what you're suggesting. Um, and I know a lot of people want that type of information because you want to go and, and, you know, uh, and place bets, but this is not about betting. It's about performance. And so to round up my answer, what I would say is those things don't matter because ultimately what we want to know is who beat who, and that's it. And whether the quarterback got injured or not, if the team keeps performing well, we want to reward it. And if the team suddenly doesn't perform well, we don't want to reward it. Yes. Okay. Yes. In, exactly. In, in chess, the problem is that this is infinitely going. It goes infinitely towards the past, infinitely towards the future. This is limited. It's a season. It's a regular season, and at the end of the season, we want a scores for each team, and that determines the rankings for each. Correct. Yes. Correct. Which is why ELO would never make any sense here. Yes. Is this? What I would say then is you don't even have to play the games. Just hand the, the title to Alabama and <laughs> just give it to Alabama and we're done. Because if you look at betting odds, the betting odds will always tell you who the, strong team, the strongest team is. And this is not about getting the strongest team. This is about getting the team that performed the best, even if it wasn't the strongest team. Yeah, then I would say use the betting odds during the season. And the betting odds, there's a simple model that you can use, a strength model, will give you the, be the, the strongest team. Is that what we'd like to do in tournaments? I would argue no. When we, we like to base our final rankings on performance, not on who was the strongest team or not, because sometimes the favorites lose. All right, uh, this is gonna be, <laughs> we're gonna be here for two hours, okay? <laughs> go ahead, and then you can go. If I start calling um, Arizona State Alabama and Alabama Arizona State, will, your, will the ranking change? And the only thing that should change is the ranking positions of Alabama and Arizona State. Nothing else should change. That's anonymity. Because otherwise, you're just ranking a team higher because of its name. 
and you don't want that. You want anonymity. All right. Yeah. So this doesn't in take into account home and away. You could include it. And one way of including it would be to have two different teams. So one team is really two different teams. It's one away team and one home team. And then you average out. So that would be one way to fix um, and include home and away if, if you think that that's important. Yes, correct. All right, let's keep going. Um, <clears throat> so I think, yeah, that's what I said. That's the last thing that I said. Um, so axiom three, uh, points assigned for victories or losses are non-decreasing in the opponent's score, which makes sense. If you face a tougher opponent, you want to get more points. If you face an opponent that's weaker, you want to get less points. And so here, notice that team four has played two and one won against team one, but lost to team two, whereas team five lost to both. So presumably, the final score of four is gonna be higher than the final score of five. We don't know this yet, but presumably that's gonna happen. But because of that, the points that two gets for beating four should be higher than the points that two gets for beating five. And that's what this axiom says. Okay, if you beat stronger opposition, you should get more points than if you beat weaker opposition, and the same for losses. All right, now we get into the quirkier axioms. This one is pretty straightforward. If two teams play the same schedule, they face exactly the same type of opposition, then we want the win percentages to do the job of uh, determining which team has a higher score. So what this axiom says is, the scores should be increasing in win percentages whenever two teams play the same opponents. Okay, and so here's an example, and notice that here, even though team one beat team three and five, but team two beat teams four and five, they both have the same records, two wins and two losses, they played the same opponents, and so the axiom says that their final scores should be the same. Whatever they are, they have to be the same. All right, and this is the quirkiest of all, which is the same idea that I just explained, but instead of applying it to direct opponents, you apply it to the opponents of your opponent, okay? So <clears throat> here's the example where teams one and two have the same schedule, they have equivalent schedules, they play the same opponents. But what if instead, team one played against team seven and eight, who then played against those opponents, and team two played teams nine and 10, who then played against those opponents. And more to the point, team seven's opponents are exactly the same as team nine's, and team eight's opponents are exactly the same as team 10's, except of course for the fact that 10 plays two and eight plays one. This is what I call equivalent second order schedule. And what the axiom says is that the, if the second order schedules are the same, then, and, sorry, the average win percentage of seven and eight is the same as the average win percentage of nine and 10, then the final scores that we give one and two should be consistent with their win percent percentages. Okay, so it's the same idea, but applied to second order schedules instead of uh, first order schedules. And, well, you can do the math calculate it, and it shows that V1 has to be equal to V2. And the, the thing about this is that I would like to point out, notice that seven and eight are both mediocre teams. They won two and lost two. Whereas two instead played against nine and 10, a really good one that won four, and a really bad one that lost all four. But because their win percentages average out, then we end up giving teams one and two the exact same score. Okay, so those, that's pretty much it. Then I have a last axiom that is a pretty straightforward one, which says, look, winning is a positive signal. It means that you're better than somebody else at some point. Losing is a negative signal. It means you're worse than somebody else at some point. Well, in that case, 
any win by any team over any opponent should always give you more points than any loss by any team over any opponent. Okay? And the intuition is pretty simple. If you believe that the most possible points that you can get for losing is because you've played this unbeatable team, if that situation is equivalent to a situation in terms of the information that you gain, there's no information, um, you lost to a team that never loses. There's no information. And the reverse could also be true. You beat a team that never wins. Well, there's no information there either. If you think that those two are equivalent, then you believe in this axiom, win dominance. Wins should always give you more points than losses. So anyway, that's it. Those are the six axioms. And it turns out, um, if you want to satisfy those six axioms, really it's the first five of them, uh, then there's only one way to do it. There's literally just one way to do it, up to a free parameter alpha. And it's incredibly simple. The final score of a team ends up being just a weighted average, where the weighted average is given by this weight alpha, of their win percentage which is this guy, and the strength of schedule, which is this guy right here. So j equals 1 to n are the opponents, the possible opponents. Uh, j i j is how many times I played j divided by how many games I played. So this is just an average score of the opponents. And that's it. A linear system, now notice that it's simple, but not that simple, because this is a linear system. If you think about college football, you have 130 teams. So each of these is 130 equations with 130 unknowns that you have to solve. Um, but the solution is unique. And go ahead, yeah. Why is it unique? Because it's a contraction mapping. And a contraction mapping leads to a unique fixed point. So it's unique. That's the beauty of it. <laughs> um, so anyway, this in matrix notation, if you, I mean, this is another way of proving that it's unique. If you use matrix notation and you take the right side and you pass it to the other side, then you can invert the matrix that you have on the other side. It's invertible, and you can prove that it's invertible. All right. <clears throat> and on top of all of this, the intuition is incredibly simple. Because instead of assigning one point for a win and zero for a loss, which is what we always do when we count win percentages, what you're really doing here is you're assigning a weighted average of one point for win and the score of your opponent. And if you lose, you're assigning a weighted average of zero points for losing and the score of your opponent. So it's a generalization of the win percentage model, which is why I called it the, general, the generalized win percentage uh, scoring system, or scoring method. All right, so I already talked about the axiomatization theorem. Um, so answering your question, existence can be proven, fairness can be proven up to an alpha greater than one half, meaning the strength of schedule has to have a weight that is less than 50%. If you start putting uh, more weight on the strength of schedule than on the win percentage of the team, then you won't satisfy fairness. Okay, so this is very important because eventually I'm going to calibrate this to the NCAA and I'm going to be able to say something about whether the NCAA was being fair or not in their ranking. Um, <clears throat> and then the other thing that I prove in the theorem, which takes a it's more difficult to prove, is that there's no other scoring system that can, um, that can satisfy all five axioms at the same time. Okay? And if you want to satisfy the sixth axiom, you need that alpha to be greater than one half. The sixth axiom was win dominance. More points for winning than for losing. All right. And so because win dominance you know, cuts in half all my possible values of alpha, what I did next was I said, all right, is it possible to weaken this win dominance assumption? And the answer is yes, because 
in my assumption uh, for win dominance, I said, I want for any possible tournament, for any number of teams, I want this to be satisfied. And I call that global fairness. And for that, alpha has to be greater than or equal to 0.5. But what happens if I say, well, I only have this many teams and I have this tournament schedule? Would the requirement uh, be lower in that case? And the answer is yes. Specifically, if you have, like college football, 130 teams that play about 13 games each, you can lower that uh, lower bound to 0.41. In other words, you can increase the weight of um, the strength of schedule component to up to 59%, okay? And then I won't talk about that, but if you wanna cheat and you wanna check for win dominance after the games were played, then you can do what's called ex post fairness and lower that alpha even further. But it's cheating, so I'll, I won't include it. Um, all right, and so, but that still leaves open the question, what alpha should you be using? And for that, I developed an, the idea of efficiency, and the idea of efficiency is, well, how close can the scores come to um, what are the true win percentages of team? And by true win percentages, what I really mean is the win percentages that the teams would have had had the tournament been complete. And I you know, define a closeness measure, which says, look, this is what my model is spitting out. These are the true win percentages. I'm just gonna minimize the sum of squares and see where that most efficient alpha is. And that generates an algorithm uh, because to generate true win percentages, you need to simulate. There's only one way of doing that. Um, and so I simulate uh, 15 different possible win matrices. For every one, um, I randomly generate incomplete tournaments 200 times for each one, and I obtained the average normalized scores over um, all possible values um, of alpha, and then compute the sum and average out, compute the sum of squares, and find the minimum. Okay, so that's the algorithm for doing that. The parameters that end up being important to obtain this most efficient alpha that one that best predicts what the true win percentages would be in the complete tournament are the number of teams, the number of games played by each team, the standard deviation of the win percentage in the complete tournament, which gives you a sense of how strong are the strong teams versus how weak are the weak teams. If that standard deviation is really high, then the strong teams are really strong because they're gonna beat up on, on the weak team. If that standard deviation is very low, then there's a lot of parity, okay? So that tends, uh, ends up mattering. And, of course, the likelihood that strong teams play against other strong teams as opposed to maybe strong teams tend to play against weak teams. And that I call the correlation parameter because it tells you how correlated the games in the incomplete tournament are, okay? And it's something that you can also calibrate to the NCAA tournament. And when I did that, um, I got these results. Well, of course, N and G, you don't have to calibrate, you just look how many teams there are, how many games they play, but you can calibrate rho and sigma w to you know, 0 0.38, 0 0.2. Okay, so in the NCAA tournament, uh, stronger teams are indeed playing against stronger opposition in general. Okay. All right, so here's just a picture of the results and um, I have all the data on GitHub, if you wanna download it, add the code for this. It's all MATLAB code, so it's nothing fancy, it's super simple, um, but the, the beauty is that you just generate, notice that for all my simulations, the alpha star, which is the, the one that minimizes the sum of squares, is always very close to the same number, as long as I keep those four parameters the same. But of course, I can change the value of those parameters, and I can do comparative statics. And so here are the comparative statics. We can talk about this if you want. Uh, I'll talk about it if anybody has a question, but otherwise I'll just keep going because otherwise it's gonna take forever. Um, but the interesting thing here is rho and how alpha star, the most efficient alpha, is highest when rho is zero. If, if the teams 
strong teams and weak teams uniformly, randomly play each other, row is zero. And the strength of schedule doesn't matter that much to adjust when you're trying to come up with your final ranking. But if strong teams play against stronger teams, now the strength of schedule component has to go up, so the alpha star has to go down. But the same thing happens if strong teams tend to play weak teams. The strength of schedule component also matters, and that's why the alpha star also goes down as you go further away from zero. Um, all right, so back to the application. So here's what I have. I have data on the results of the NCAA tournaments between 2011 and 2017. I have data on pregame betting odds. Um, and I have rankings from the NCAA for all, these, for all these years. And why do I need them? Because I want to calibrate the five parameters that I've been discussing. I want to, well, N and G are really not something that you calibrate. Number of teams, number of games that each team plays. For the regular season, it would be 11. If you compute also uh, the bowls, then it goes up to 13. Uh, and sometimes 14. And I want to ca calibrate rho. Unfortunately, to calibrate rho, you have to get a little cute because you don't have data for the complete tournament. You only have data for the incomplete tournament, which is teams play only 11 games each. And so the way in which you can do that, the way in which you can calibrate rho is you can use betting odds to elicit the strength of a team and then check to see who's playing who and run a regression and calibrate row. Um, and you can do the same thing for uh, sigma w, which is the, um, the dispersion of the win percentages. And so you can jointly calibrate those. And then finally, you can calibrate alpha. Essentially, you can ask the question, of all the possible values of alpha, which one comes closest to matching what the NCAA uh, ranking committee did? Okay, and so that's what I do. I, again, I can go through um, exactly how I calibrated things, um, but in the interest of time, I'm just gonna skip it, but there's a strength model involved, which is super simple, where the probability of beating your opponent is directly related to your relative strength. That allows you to calibrate a vector of s implicit strengths, which you can then use, and by the way, which you can then check and those implicit strengths are log normally distributed. Um, I have results for all the years close to log normally distributed. Remember, I only have 130 observations here, so I'm not working with a lot of data each year. Um, and then you can compute, once you've computed the implied strengths, you can perform this linear regression of the log of your strength to the log of your strength of schedule and see what the correlation is, and then you can use that to back out that row coefficient. Um, and you can do the same thing for sigma w. And the good news is that they're not very related, which means that the calibration, even though it's joint, um, you can converge very quickly. Um, oops. And then you can even verify that your strength model was a good idea by comparing uh, the standard deviation of the win percentage in the incomplete tournament to that of the data. So the simulated one versus the data. And when I did that, I got um, differences of between 6% and 15%, which you know, for the limited amount of data that I had is, is really good. Um, all right, so then here's a, here's a regression just to show you a regression result, and you notice that the regression results always, and this is 2011, are always hovering between 0.3 and 0.4, um, and that's what I use to calibrate row, and this is for every year, and I only have 130 observations each year, and you know the, the results come out pretty clean. Um, and then finally, how do I calibrate alpha? Because to calibrate alpha is the most difficult thing, because I only have 25 observations each year for that, so everything could go wrong here. Um, but I do have results and I do have the final rankings, and so the calibration strategy will be uh, to use data on the results and um, 
and with the data on the results, for every possible value of alpha, I'm gonna generate rankings. And then I'm gonna compare those rankings for the different values of alpha to the actual ranking by the CFP committee. So what I need to do that is I need a best fit metric, and so getting the right best fit metric is important. And then I just repeat it for every year in the sample. Okay, so what is my best fit metric? This is it, and it's an absolute value of the log differences in the ranking position, so xi, well, this is, there it is. xi is the ranking position by the CFP committee, and y alpha i would be the ranking position of that same team by the different values of alpha, okay? And I take the difference in logs, I take the absolute difference, and then I sum up over all 25 ranking positions to get a best fit metric. Of course, I wanna minimize this in order to get the best fit, okay? So, the two things that I have to determine are this value of kappa, and what kappa does is essentially it puts more or less weight on the top ranking positions versus the lower ranking positions. And if you calibrate this so that the weight is evenly distributed on the errors, you get a, a kappa of 2.5. And then using a kappa of 2.5, I minimize to get um, the best fit. And so for robustness, because I, again, I only had 25 observations each year, I was worried um, that the results would be all over the place. I used different values of kappa. I used a sum of square differences instead of sum of um, absolute differences. I used actual differences instead of log differences. So I went all over the place with that. Um, and I even used the associated press rankings as opposed to the, uh, uh, the, the NCAA committee rankings. And the good news is that it always resulted in a calibrated value of alpha that was very close to 0.2. And this is true regardless of what type of best fit I, I decided to use. So you will notice, and again, remember, these are 25 observations. So this, I, I was shocked by these results. You get pretty much the same results with very few exceptions, like this one, 0.37, and this one, 0.41. You, you pretty much get the same results, which means that it really is the case that the CFP committee, if you wanna interpret this way, in a behavioral way, has a certain alpha in mind when they're creating their rankings. Um, and so now the good stuff. Now we can say, all right, now that we've calibrated the alpha for the CFP committee for each different year, now that we know the fairness bounds for each different year, and now that we know what would, be, would have been efficient for each of those years, we get this picture. And uh, this has everything, essentially. It has the global fairness bound up there, which means that if you wanna be fair, globally fair, well, this, is, this guy's gone. If you wanna be globally fair, you need your alpha to be above 0.5, and that doesn't matter what year you're talking about. If you wanna be ex ante fair, meaning we know the tournament that we're playing and we wanna be fair just for this tournament, you need the alpha to be above 0.41. And that again, doesn't depend on the year. If you wanna be efficient, you look at the blue line and you'll notice that to be efficient, you want your alpha to be between 0.1 and 0.2. What does that mean? It means that the strength of schedule component should be between 80 and 90% of your final score. And what did the CFP do? Well, the CFP, which is the red line for every year, came very close to what was most efficient, but certainly below what would have been fair. And so that's you know, the first two conclusions that, uh, that I get from this work. But of course, the third conclusion, which is to me the most interesting one, is what about biases? Because now that we've calibrated alpha for the CFP, we have an objective measure, an objective ranking given by the implied alpha, but we also have the subjective ranking that was given by uh, the CFP committee. And so, 
I disaggregated by conference. Any number above one means the conference was overrated that year. Any number below one means it was underrated that year. And I don't know if you notice a pattern or not. Some of you may, some of you may not. The, the five overrated conferences were the big five conferences. And the five underrated conferences were all the not part of the big five conferences. Um, but then you can also do something else. You can, if you disaggregate by conference, you can disaggregate by team. And so some people are not gonna like this. <laughs> but then you can find the most overrated teams <laughs> on a yearly basis. And this is, you know, this is the data that I had, 2011 to 2017, okay? So please don't get offended. It turns out Michigan State was the most overrated team in college football between 2011 and 2017. Um, but on the one hand, you wanna say, all right, fine, but maybe Michigan State was rated you know, 12th when it should have been rated 7th. Do we really care? Well, what you can do next is you can say, all right, were some teams left out of the playoffs when they shouldn't have been? Are there any such cases? And the answer is yes. And I call those the most notable offenses. First one, 2011, Oklahoma State left out of the final in favor of Alabama, that ended up winning the tournament. 2012, <laughs> you see a pattern? Florida <laughs> was left out of the final in favor of Alabama. I'm gonna get in so much trouble. Um, 2014, TCU left out in favor of Ohio State. And 2017, indeed UCF, remember at the first slide, was left out of the playoff in favor of Oklahoma. But the interesting thing about this was that despite the fact that UCF was left out of the playoff that year and Alabama got to play two really good teams and beat them to win the national championship. And UCF in its bowl game got to play some other team that wasn't as good as those top four teams, presumably. Despite all of that, if you run this not for the regular season, but for the whole season, including bowl games and um, the playoff and the, the championship game, what comes out is that UCF still should have been declared the champion that year. And instead, Alabama was the champion. So that's it, that's, that's what I have. Um, I'll take in any questions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. You, yeah. Okay, so you're talking about optimal design of tournaments. If, you're, if your intention is to create a final ranking, then playoffs are not what you want. But if your intention is to declare a champion, playoff is, Nothing beats playoffs, if that's your intention. Um, it's the um, most efficient way of declaring a champion without controversy, is to have playoffs. Like, playoffs, the whole structure of the tournament be playoffs, which is a little bit what tennis does. You go into a tournament, and you essentially enter a bracket. There's no groups, there's, there's not, nothing like that. But this is different. No, it's not, and that's the beauty of this, because this doesn't rely on um, eigenvectors, and I, I don't wanna get into too much of the math, but um, if you rely on eigenvectors, then you have a problem that if the win matrix is not irreducible, 
then you end up assigning a score for any team that goes undefeated that's higher than the score that you assign any team that's not undefeated. This doesn't do that because it specifically rules out eigenvector solutions. I can talk more about that if you want, but it's in the alpha, okay? I'd have to go all the way back. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Uh, we can talk later if, and, and I can show you. I can show you the math, but yes, you're gonna have to believe me on that, okay? <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. But you know what ELO, what um, ELO doesn't wouldn't do here. Um, if you have a low ranking, a low ELO ranking, and you beat another team, another team, another player, um, your ranking goes up, and it does it goes up as a function as a function of your own ranking and the other, the other player's ranking. But then the other player's ranking goes down, and now somebody else plays that same player. The, I don't know what ELO would do in that case. Does it even converge? Do you know? I don't, uh, yeah, no, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I wouldn't know if it would converge or not. I, that's a good question. To, I, I haven't, I haven't, you know, dug into that question. Yeah, I, I, I'll look into it. Actually, I'll, I'll try to answer your question <laughs> because I'm interested. I looked into ELO when I was doing this, and I quickly realized that. It had nothing, that the system, the way in which it worked, the mechanism, had nothing to do with what I wanted to do because of what you mentioned, which is that this, the tournaments that I deal with have an, a starting point and a finishing point, and then that's it. Whereas, yeah. Yeah. No, 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 that's, that's fine. Um, but I don't know if ELO would converge, and that would be my, I wish I could answer your, your question, but I, that I don't know. You wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah. Again. For a simulation, it would be fun, yeah, to do that. Yeah, definitely. All right, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Correct. Why would you assume that would be my question. Because this tells you whether they're playing better teams or not. Fair enough. Okay. Sorry, I can't, I can't see you because I have the light beaming on me. There you go. No, no. Maybe if I go like this. There you go. Now I can see you. I would say this doesn't have anything to say about that. Um, should and it? should it? 
So my, my, my answer would be, what do you want to reward then? The presence of good athletes? Do you want to reward the fact that we all know that Alabama is a better team than um, some, you know, ASU, just to, to, just to, to use my school, <laughs> that, that we know this? Or do you want to reward performance? Period. Did you win or did you lose? And what this does is it says, it takes a stance on that in the sense, we're just gonna reward here who wins and who loses, even though we know that if it was, if we were really trying just to decipher what team is the strongest, just give the title to Alabama every year and we're done. We don't even have to play the tournament. The reason why we watch sports, I would even say, is because for us, rooting for a team to eke out that win makes us want to watch it. And because it's valued the same as that other great team that has all the best athletes and that can run up the score. We got the same outcome because we eked out a win as those other guys. And that allows us eventually to possibly compete at the same level or make it to the final playoff round. Otherwise, what you end up doing is you just end up deciding, all right, whoever scores the most points over the season, because they're the strongest team, they're, we're going to declare them the champion. This idea of having an, a, a beginning and an end to a game that we all go watch and that the reward for that is the same, regardless of how you got that win. To me, that's crucial, and it's the, the reason why we love sports. So I wouldn't change that, I personally, but if you wanna change it, and you wanna add things like, by how much a team wins, or some measure of how you know, fast and tall and big the athletes were, sure, you can do that. It just wouldn't be, to me, rewarding performance, which is what I want to do. So, okay. It's a mess. Okay. Yep. That's why that's why this adjusts for strength of schedule. And that's that's the whole reason for the paper is to ask the question how much should you adjust for strength of schedule? And if you want to be fair, only up to 50%. If you want to be efficient, you can go all the way up to 90%. If you want to do what the NCAA football playoff committee does, keep it between 20 and 25%. It gives you the to decide that, okay? But it, it imposes consequences. Like if you're gonna have the strength of schedule be 90% of a team's final score, okay, then you're not really being fair, but you are being efficient. And that's the trade-off that you're willing to take, and I'm perfectly fine with that, okay? <clears throat> yes? If you, if you want to include the difference, the, the score difference of a game, you can do that. You can update the win matrix. Instead of being a 1-0 event, it'll just be a you know, 55 to 35 event. And it's like, it, think of it as this team, because it scored 35 points on this other team, it beat this other team 35 times. The other team only scored 17 points, so it beat this team, and so you can just pretty much run the same thing using 
the scores of the games instead of whether a team beat another team. And you would get a completely different outcome. My intuition would say you're going to end up with Alabama <laughs> being the champion every single year. But that's fine. I mean, if, if that's what you want, then that's what you should do. Um, it's, it's, I'm totally fine with it. Yes. Oh, yeah, it is you. Correct, yes. Great question. I think that the committee has different um, guidelines. That they, they, there are certain things that they have to do, right? They, certain champions that they have to put in. Um, yeah. I, I, I would definitely use this for, for basketball, for seeding. I would definitely use it. Um, but I think the guidelines in, the, in college football will, have always been a little bit more strict. And um, there's more controversy in college football, which is why I chose college football. But yeah, um, this applies to any tournament that is incomplete. That's the key. The key word is incomplete, meaning you have a certain number of teams and the number of games that are played by each team is always less than the number of teams minus one. That's an incomplete tournament. And if you're in the presence of an incomplete tournament, this will help you solve the issue of how to rank teams. So it definitely applies to college basketball. Yeah. Go ahead. That's true too, yeah. There's only four teams. <laughs> Because the athletes would die. <laughs> no, you can't. The, and a, 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 no, but I mean, I haven't, I haven't played football, uh, American football, but it's the, the, the wear and tear from a game is huge compared to a basketball game. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you could do that. <laughs> yeah, I think there's less controversy. There's 64 teams that are picked, right? In basketball. 68. Yeah, so it means that you know, everybody wins in college basketball. And, and in college football, you can't do it because of the wear and tear of the games. You can only have a limited amount of games. So that's the sad part, but well, this can help objectively figure out how to do it. That's the key here. You wanna be objective. All right, so I guess this is it. Thank you very much.